said, but I can call you Bob, so I Indeed. thank you very much for that. I was interviewing a, a colleague of yours a little while back, Baroness Cox, and she's told me a fascinating story about how she became a member of the House of Lords. How did it happen for you? Well, um, as a businessman, I was involved in, um, with a group of businessmen in the Midlands, and they uh, eventually elected me as chairman of a thing called Midlands Industrial Council, and we used to meet with politicians. In fact, uh, this particular group was formed after the Second World War, I was really opposed to the nationalisation of all our industries at that time and it just carried on for all those years and so I, I was elected chairman and for about seven years I was chairman of that organisation and in the process uh, became visible to uh, members of the uh, Conservative Party and got to know them uh, because they would come up and speak and tell us about their policies, they would listen to what we had to say and hopefully we had some uh, opportunity of at least putting forward uh, ideas which we thought would be helpful to the, the nation because if business is successful it employs people and uh, so I get, became visible to them. I have been a donor by the way to the Conservative Party for 25 years um, and uh, eventually one day I was asked if uh, I would like to become a working peer. I have to say my first question was what does working mean? <laughs> because I ha already had a job and uh, I don't like to commit to something unless I'm going to do it. And I was told, well, I'd need to attend a certain number of days and uh, they sit about 150 days a year and I'd have to be there for about 75 and vote in a number of times, etc. I thought about it and then I came back and said, OK, I think I can do that. And uh, so I, I was eventually in uh, 2011, January, uh, became a peer. Well, here we are in the United Kingdom, but life for you began in uh, a continent far away, over in India, and then you also you spent some of your time in, in Africa. Were your parents working over there? Is that how that no, happened? No, what happened is my... Um, I've got a very... Uh, people of a colonial past have rather interesting histories because there's been an intermixing of nations. Uh, so my mother is... Uh, uh, my father is English and Scottish, my mother is Spanish, German, Dutch and Irish and I was born in India in 1946. Um, in fact my grandfather on my father's side was born on a boat going out to India. It was a part of a theatrical touring company and uh, so my father was born in India and on my mother's side it was a Spanish sea captain um, and uh, I don't know, somehow or other they all ended up in in India, but of course when India got independence in 47 there uh, was a lot of rioting between the Muslims and Hindus at that time a lot of people were getting killed, I think something like three million people died and my parents decided it wasn't a good place for us to be bringing the kids up my father had been a pilot by the way in the war fighting against the Japanese who were uh, in Burma at that time so we came to England when I was three we spent seven years here and then when I was ten my father still having itchy feet went to Africa as a bush pilot and eventually um, we ended up in Kenya where he was uh, business manager of uh, the new airport that was opened so I spent five years there so I I learned to love overseas locations especially warm overseas <laughs> locations um, and uh, yeah so a lot of our mission activity is, is directed to those kind of places Okay, you've, you've invested a lot of time and energy into children and, and education and hopefully a little later on we can talk about the faith academies that you've begun in the West Midlands. What was childhood like and was there a godliness in your home? Uh, my mother was a strict Catholic and my father didn't have any particular faith and in those days Catholics uh, had to, um, if they were going to marry a non-Catholic, the non-Catholic had to make a commitment that they'd bring the children up as Catholic. So I was brought up as a Catholic until I was 17, um, but I never really knew God. Uh, well, I knew of him, and I feared him, and didn't like him very much because he was this fearsome, awesome God who was going to hit you every time you did something wrong. And I was a rather mischievous child. In fact, so much so I was held down for, for one year at school because I played truant for six months, mm -hmm. um, which is all the more amusing now that I, I sponsor three city academies. Yeah. So how did you come to faith in Christ? Well, we came when we were back in England. Um, that somebody dropped a leaflet through the letterbox of our home uh, inviting 
us to a local Pentecostal church. Uh, well, my father, who at this time was starting to search, uh, decided to go. And then he later on asked me to go, which was interesting because I don't think I'd have been able to go. My mother would have stopped me um, had it not been my father taking me. So I went to this local Pentecostal church, and of course there were people saying hallelujah, praise the Lord, and singing with gusto, and they seemed to like God, which was a different experience to what I'd had. And there was something about it that was quite fascinating to me. And eventually one day I left a youth hall in Dagenham in Essex, and I remember looking down the alleyway, and it was late at night, just coming out of this meeting, and in my mind's eye, I could see that Jesus was on the cross and that he died for me. And that was really the moment when I just accepted Christ and became a Christian when I was 17. Right. Amazing story. And clearly life has gone on and you've been able to see the Lord at work in amazing ways. But if anyone looks up on the web your details or finds some newspapers or headlines of you, it almost invariably says um, 6,000 redundancy check turned into millions. Mm. Tell us a little bit about your story, could you please? Well, let, let me back up a little bit. When I was 17, there was a word in our church which was, you will stand before kings. And I felt God spoke to me from this word. And I thought I was going to be a missionary back to Africa. And because there's kings in Africa, lots of kings living in grass huts and tribal leaders and what have you. And I wanted to go back there. I, I loved it. I, so I tried to, to do that. There was a project called Lifeline to Africa, to South Africa. Um, but it just never worked out. Many years later, I found a scripture which said, See a man diligent in business, he will stand before kings. And kings meant leaders and rulers. And of course, God has done all that in my life. Uh, since, but for, for many years, of course, that hadn't happened. Um, and in fact, one of my guys who used to f uh, be scared of flying, I said, Don't worry, you can fly with me, I can't die. Uh, nothing can happen to me uh, because I've got this word and I know that God's going to do this in my life. Well, of course, now that protection is gone, um, but uh, God has fulfilled what He said. So, yes, I, I, uh, I'd had a career, I studied to be accountant, I had a pretty difficult first few years because I got married when I was 20 and I had my son when I was 22, so we were in kind of deep financial trouble. And I started studying to be an accountant, by the time I was 27 I qualified. And I became a finance director of a company just at the time when there was the oil crisis and the three day working week, and the company went broke. And so I got my redundancy check of £6,000. So my career had sort of dived off a cliff. Mm. But I, with that, I was able to set up a parts business for, uh, for the cars, Jensen cars, that we were selling previously. And from then it's gone on, and I suppose the business, well, this year it will have made about £80 million pounds profit. And uh, in 2015, the projections are even higher. So it's doing extremely well, and I gradually bought out my partner, who was the owner of the company that went broke, uh, he asked me to set up the new company, and he gave me the redund uh, redundancy money, which bought me 15%. And bit by bit, I bought him out. So in 1988, I had 100% ownership of the company. And to achieve that, you must be a risk taker, Bob. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, I think when I first started, I risked everything because everything wasn't very much. <laughs> Um, and so I probably was a bigger risk taker when I was younger. Uh, in fact, when you have more, you have more to lose than to gain. Whereas before I had nothing really. And so I had everything to gain. And so I, I, I risked it all. Now I would make much bigger decisions, but they represent a smaller proportion uh, of what I have. Uh, so yeah, uh, we've had to take some risks. Although I, I have to say, I've always felt that you know, God's been with me. I think when I'm not in good relationship with God, I probably make my worst decisions because Samson wished not the Spirit of God had left him. He felt the same as before, um, but he did some stupid things. Uh, and similarly, I think I've, I've had times in my life when I haven't probably been uh, right with God completely 
and probably I made some silly decisions then. But overall, I think that God's been incredibly good to me because I don't regard myself as the most intelligent person in the world. Certainly from my academic, academic background, I, I, I haven't been. Well, I'd like to push you a little bit on, on that because the perception is that for people to succeed in business, certainly in the way that you have, there must be corners that are cut, there must be a bit of corruption, there must be a bit of bribery, there must be you know, who you know and how you say it. And, and ha has, how has God played a part in your life and how has he protected you from some of those things? Well, first of all, I, I would say I only control 25% of my business. I can control how many people I employ, what products I sell, uh, where I locate my business. The big things I do not control. I don't control the economy, the taxation, government policy. I don't control currency levels. I don't control what the competitors are doing. All the big things I don't control. Mm -hmm. So to run a successful business, you have to be able to anticipate those things. And I believe as Christians, we're in touch with God. And, and therefore, there's a kind of an enlightened sense of anticipation, if you like. Mm -hmm. And good information equals good decisions. If you don't have good information, you can't make a good decision. So I believe we're on the inside track. So that element of it is... In terms of um, corrupt business practices, A, you get yourself in an awful lot of trouble... And it may only work for a short time. If someone lies, cheats and steals, people won't deal with them a second time. And I actually, one of my strongest principles is keep your word. And so if I shake hands on a deal, you don't need a piece of paper um, because a piece of paper can't necessarily cover everything anyhow. I, I'm employed previously a former president of Bank of America. And he said, we have loan documents that are that thick. He says, but actually there's only two things I need to know. Are you going to be willing to repay and are you going to be able to repay? A 20-page loan document is not going to tell me that. And so I believe in, in that we should keep our word. You know, what would happen if God didn't keep his word? If he said, oh, I didn't really mean that, or oh, I was only joking, um, or uh, it didn't suit me anymore and I want to change. We rely on the Word of God as being the absolute foundation and we can put, trust our lives to it. So similarly, I, I, I basically place a high premium on what I say and, and stand by it. The only exception I would say is, let's say I fell under a bus. Well, I, I'm not in a position to, mm. to fulfill what I said. Or... If something really disastrous happened, I would have to go to that person and ask them if they wouldn't mind waiting or release me or something. But it hasn't happened yet. Um, so I don't give my word very easily, by the way. I'm very uh, reluctant to give my word because when I do, I'm bound by it. I think people like that. They like to know that, that when you say something, you're going to do it. You're going to deliver. Um, I have a property company as well, and um, often we get the deal, even though we bid less than somebody else, because they know we'll deliver, mm -hmm. and they know we'll uh, actually come through on what we said. So I think people like to do business with you when they think you're honest. Mm. Bob, here you are, one of the most successful businessmen in the country, and undoubtedly one of the wealthiest. The Bible talks a lot about money doesn't say money is evil it says the love of money is evil how do you keep your Christian walk fresh day by day when you are surrounded by all this opulence I once met Demas Shikarian Demas was the guy who started full gospel businessman's fellowship and actually I was in a conference in America uh, and he wanted to see me and I said oh I'm really busy and uh, and he said, well, I'll come to your hotel. Well, I was really ashamed when he came because I didn't realise he was in a wheelchair and he was not well at all. But he came to the hotel and I felt really ashamed that I hadn't made the effort and he'd made the effort to come and see me. Um, and when we had a conversation, I said, Demas, I don't know why I've got what I've got um, because there's people who are cleverer than me, 
people who are more worthy than me seems to... I don't know why. He says, well, I know. I said, well, you'll have to tell me because I don't. And he said, because you never made it your God. Um, I do also remember twice when I was 17, God asked me to take everything out of my pocket and uh, it was a church meeting and empty it into the, uh, in the offering. And I did it on two occasions. And I had to walk home from East Ham to Elm Park in, near, in Essex. It was about seven miles in the dark because I didn't even know the bus fare. I put all the change in and everything. And I honestly believe that was a test. Um, in fact, I've had another test many years later where uh, I really was, had no money at all. And God said to me, I want you to give the preacher five pounds. I said, God, I haven't got five pounds. I'm overdrawn at the bank. He said, OK, then make it ten. And, and I said, well, if I haven't got five, I haven't got ten. I kept arguing with God until it got to 50. And then I suddenly said, God, stop. I can't afford to argue with you anymore. I'll do the 50. So I've learned, uh, if God tells you to do something, do it. And uh, don't argue, because it's only going to get more expensive if you argue. Mm -hmm. So I think there's been one or two little tests along the way. Um, so I, the Bible says it's him that gives the power to create wealth. So I can't take any real credit for it, um, because even any intelligence I may have was given to me by him. So, uh, Bob, we, we get as a TV station many, many letters from viewers, and we know that there are people who are watching this program who are struggling with debt, who maybe are looking for work, who are maybe uh, are working, but, but find it very hard at the end of each month to balance for books. Out of your years of experience of, of being in work and, and in business and employing people, are there some guidelines that you would say to folks which are really the basics that they need to follow if they want to see the hand of the Lord lead them out of debt? I, can, I, don't gen, I get hundreds of letters, as you can imagine, and I can't possibly deal with them all uh, because we're focusing our giving on uh, certain specific mission projects. But there was one particular lady who wrote to me some years ago, and please don't all the viewers write to me now because uh, I won't be able to reply. But she wrote to me, and, and it was clear, it's something about her that uh, touched me, uh, uh, and she was in debt, and etc. And I said to him, look, if you will go to your local vicar and agree with him a plan to resolve your situation, I will help you. The biggest delight for me was when she wrote back and said, I've gone and produced the plan, and thank you, I don't any longer need your help. And so that would be my advice. Take advice from people who understand these things and listen to it. My sister used to advise people, and she said, get the credit card and cut it up and start looking at the areas where you spend money. Are you a smoker or a drinker or are, do you gamble or are you wasting money in certain areas? Look at those areas and try and cut back. The other thing I would say is... Don't just bury your head in the sand if you owe money. You need to talk to the people you owe the money to um, and, and try and work out a plan with them. I think the government has introduced quite a number of measures whereby people can actually do a deal with their creditors if they're really in, in difficulty. So uh, the last thing people, uh, the creditor wants is for you to say nothing and not respond to letters and tie the, the tie. Uh, tear them up and throw them in the dustbin, ultimately you'll get evicted if that happens. But go and talk to them and see if you can't uh, resolve matters. Okay. Bob, I began the programme by talking about you being a member of the House of Lords, and as we come towards the end, that's where I want to focus back in on. Um, so many people, particularly in the Christian church, are frustrated with what they see happening in the Houses of Parliament and some of the bills that are coming through. As an insider, how... How can we have a greater influence as Christians upon what happens in the House of Lords? How can we get our point across to members of Parliament? How should we be praying? Well, first of all, they're not the only ones. I'm frustrated too, uh, because there are some things that are going through. And of course, you can't get everybody to agree on everything. And even there are Christians that are on both sides of some of the more controversial arguments. Um, I think you have to stand by what you believe, and, which is what I have done. Uh, and, and my record on some things, uh, which I won't go into here, uh, stands. Um, but 
I believe it's important that Christians do engage. There is an organisation called Christians in Parliament. We should pray for them. There are Christians in Parliament. There's another one called Christians in Politics. I've been quite supportive of them uh, to encourage them to improve their website, improve their uh, connections with the church outside, call for things like flash prayer, uh, this kind of thing, mm. or when there's any bills going through. So one of the things that is very influential is to write to your local politician, because I know uh, on some of the issues, votes have been changed as a result of a mailbag uh, that the local MP has received, uh, and they were going to vote one way, or they decided to abstain as a result of that, or even vote against. So uh, that is an important thing people can do. I think it's, it's good if other Christians get involved in politics. Christian organizations get involved in lobbying. Um, so I believe those, those are important things that can be done. Um, yeah, the, the, those are the, the main things. But I think writing, uh, I get frustrated as well when sometimes, like for instance, one of the petitions that went through was almost completely ignored. Mm -hmm. um, and that's rather sad. The, the problem is Christians don't want to be seen as being continually against everything. We should be putting forward what we're for as well. And right at this present time, I think it's very interesting to see that 80% of food banks are run by Christian organizations. And the country is going through uh, some difficult times. We're having to make some tough choices. And I I think Christians can be very relevant at that time and actually engage their local politicians in what they're doing. Um, I once saw a senior politician and, and uh, they were talking about various things and, and, and the, the big society at the time, it was a few years ago, and I said, well, have you been talking to, to the church? And they said, well, we did talk to this one, and they said, well, we're already doing it. I said, well, you really need to get out and understand what the church is doing. When there were the riots in, in London, it was church groups that went out and cl cleaned up the streets. I think this is a fantastic witness. And uh, I think also church attendance now and people becoming Christians in this country has now bottomed out and it's starting to rise again. So I do think, don't just curse the dark, light a candle. Bob, it's fascinating to talk with you. Next time I particularly want to talk about some of the charitable work you're involved with. In the last minute of the programme, if I said to you, just tell us one thing that's happening through the charitable work that you're involved with, which would bless us as a people and encourage us, what would it be? Well, I think we have a huge opportunity with the internet to touch the world. It's being used for bad, but it can also be used for good. So I think new technologies are opening up new opportunities new horizons for us as Christians to really be in touch with the world for Jesus. Amen. Well, Bob, it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much indeed. You've been watching Heroes of the Faith. My guest today has been Lord Bob Edminster, and I look forward to being with you next time when I'm going to be talking some more with him. Thank you. God bless.
This is an appeal to stop dirty water deaths. Sadly, you won't see it in the news. But today, dirty water will kill 1,400 children, more than malaria and AIDS combined. These children have no choice but to drink water from rivers, swamps, and stagnant ponds every day. Imagine your child drinking dirty water, knowing the next sip could kill. Right now, you can help save a child's life Simply text TAP to 70123 to give WaterAid £3. WaterAid already has teams in place to install the pipes, pumps and taps that will bring clean water to children at risk. They just need your support. In the next minute, dirty water will kill another child. So please, don't wait to save a child's life. Text TAP to 70123 to give £3 now. Thank you. Revelation Television is committed to making a wide range of Christian television programs. From studies to documentaries, from debates to music programs, from testimonies to talk shows. All are made possible because of your support for Revelation Foundation. Thank you for making it possible. important that when you pick up these things, I mean, you know these things deep down on the 